Hi, and welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm Meredith Atwood, author of the book, The Year of No Nonsense. I'm a former attorney turned writer, speaker, and Ironman triathlete. Although right now, all I really like to do is lift weights. We all have the same 24 hours, but it's what we do in those hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. It's my goal to crack the code on a life of less nonsense so we can all make the most of our 24 hours. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Same 24 Hours podcast. I am your host, Old Faithful. Meredith Atwood is here. I'm very excited about this very special guest. I'm always excited about my guests, but I'm very excited today. I have Hildy Dunn here. She is my coach. Yay. Hi, Hildy. Welcome. Yay, old faithful that I love dearly. (laughs) And it, you know, it says a lot that you're still here and that we still talk. So, you know, there's hope for anyone. That's the summary. (laughs) So funny story, um, right before getting on this podcast, um, I had an aha moment, um, about authoring my life and about owning my shit and how it came about was I sat in on one of my daughter's math classes and I did not like what the teacher said and did. And I, and I, the, you know, not the old me, but my internal struggle was this is his fault. This is all his fault. And the summary was a bunch of kids are behind, including my sweet, precious, innocent, perfect 12 year old (laughs) daughter, right? Um, But I had this moment where I thought, oh my gosh, this is not my problem. These teachers, da, 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 da. And I went to start an email because that's what I do, write a strongly worded email. Um, And as I was writing it, I thought, oh my gosh, Handel method, Hildy Dunn. (laughs) authoring my life, owning my part. And I started to realize, okay, I'm upset because this is hitting on my failure. Like I've had my head in the sand on a couple things. Um, You know, there was a lot of parenting fails in this whole mix. And so as I began to structure the email, um, I, I was like, so first of all, I have to own a couple things. Number one, I have been oblivious. You know, number two, I've got a daughter who would rather have her teeth pulled than actually attend class, <laughs> you know, but it was so interesting how the, the kabam of the initial dynamic was, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kill everyone to, oh, I have a role in this. And I know that's like classic, classic Handel method. And Hildy is a coach with the Handel group and we'll get into that. But I wanted to start there with the concept of ownership and authoring our lives and accountability and responsibility because so much of what we experience as humans, there, there's some blame, there's some you know, not so great stuff, but how does the concept of authoring our lives start to play a role in the coaching you do and, and what the Handel Group does? It's the game changer. The right? game because changer. We believe that you are the author Right. And there's power in that because it leaves you the mastermind. It leaves you actually the one that has the pen and is writing the story of your life. And when things are going well in our life, we're like, yeah, I authored that, you know, yeah, I wrote that book. Yeah. I ran that marathon. Yeah. I, you know, drew that picture. Like the things that are great were so great to call ours. And then the places that we're not doing well, are the places it's very easy to what we call weather report, meaning you're acting like we just have no power over it, just like the weather reporter will report on the weather like it's cloudy over New Jersey, you know, or it's sunny in Massachusetts. Like there's nothing you could do, but, you know, put on your sunscreen, put on your snow boots, like whatever the weather is. Like there's no, so, but the problem with that is it steals your power from you. And it leaves you a victim to circumstance rather than being able to actually do something, right? And the power, and I believe the pride and the happiness comes in the doing. Mm. Now, the other thing you said that I really have to say something about fast is 
there's no beating yourself up, no being mean. Like there's, that's not the point of this. What we call coptuitiveness, meaning like the ability to cop to something that you have to own. One, it's so that you can get back to authoring. But two, it's not about feeling bad. And it's not about beating yourself up. And it's not about being mean or shame. Because what that does is has you want to hide it. And it keep, that's what keeps it around. And then we keep repeating the same thing and uh, getting the same results. So right. the point of authoring and the point of this is, yeah, take your power back and go, okay, what can I do? What did I do? What's my part in the dance? In With the result being, how do I make a change? Or how am I going to now mastermind something? And not, ugh, I'm bad, I stink, is my bad parenting. There is a coptuitiveness without a feeling bad being mean to yourself. Right. And that is super important because like my coptuitiveness <laughs> is okay. So I missed that. Um, I need to, you know, be more active. So what, and I learned of a couple of things a couple of weeks ago, and I blocked off three to five on my calendar every day for the rest of the school year, because I realized I have to, I have to sit down with my children for at least an hour each. I have two of them. And that's part of me copying to what I've got to do, you know, and, and that's the action. It's like, oh, well, I could feel bad for the, you know, eight years I didn't do a great job parenting, <laughs> which there's a lot of those, but also I'd have a lot of wins along the way too, but it's that responsibility. And, and when you take that action, like blocking off my calendar, doing what I say I'm going to do, there's a, there's a weight lifted off of you. And I've seen it in my children too, because we've sat down, we've looked at the truth, We've looked at what it's going to take. We created a plan and they're lighter because of it. So it's like everyone, when you cop to your role in it, especially as a parent um, and your kids see you do that, they're empowered to also own what they need to own. That's what I, I've seen. So have you seen that yeah. kind of, yeah. Exactly. That's how really the power comes from walking the talk, not just talking the talk. And so that's what we teach people, right? And in order to really own the coptuitiveness and be clear about it, there's three things you have to do. One is you have to know what the dream is. So for you, you'd be like, what's the dream for my relationship with my daughter? What's the dream for how I want to handle this situation now, which is, you know, homeschooling and yeah, how do I want to do that? What's the dream? Meaning, where are you going? What's the GPS? Like, what do you want? right? Because that shows you where you're going and it reminds you, you know, what you're designing for, right? So right. one is being clear on the dream. Two is what's going on, what's getting in the way, right? And sometimes it's not taking the right action. And you're like, oh, duh, I should sit down with her for an hour a day. I got it. So no feeling bad, no stabbing yourself. No, you just go, oh, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Right, so it's dealing with what's getting in your way. And a lot of what gets in our way is our inner dialogue, the thoughts that we have, right? So once you get clear on the dream, once you understand what's getting in the way, usually in terms of what do you think, like, what are you thinking? Like, how is that creating your reality? Because what we think we create, um, then you get to the right actions, which is you going, oh, there's things I can do, which gives you your power back which stops you from feeling bad, which is a diversion. Like it's just all about take that, all that feeling bad out and just go, hmm, based on the dream, what action should I take? Yes, yes, the dream. And, and so Handel covers 12 areas of life. Like, you know, we kind of look at our life like this one big blob sometimes like, ah, my life. But Handel breaks it down into 12 different areas, which allows you to, you know, figure out which areas are really bleeding, <laughs> which ones are great. And you can, you can kind of focus and bring up certain areas that are low. So what Hildy does, she has basically inserted a 13th area of life with her work, which is death. And I wanted to wait to tell everyone that that's what we were talking about today, because I tricked you. <laughs> Because no one wants to talk you. about it. Told you. Um, I definitely wanted to talk about authoring and owning, and you know that because it is also a fundamental part of the thirteenth area of life. 
And so I love the work that Hildy does. And any of you listen to the podcast a lot know that I've talked to Dr. BJ Miller a couple of times. And so I'm very passionate about this subject as well. And so I want to do a, a coronavirus t- style pivot <laughs> since we're all just pivoting in everything right now and start to talk about, about death and how we can design our lives around this 13th area that's inevitable and what your story is, Hildy, because this is where I think your, your power and your strength really is because you have such a beautiful way of telling the story and it, it's really good food for thought. So I'm going to just turn the floor over to you here because I know you, you know what, where to go. So yeah. let's talk about death. I'm passionate about this subject, mostly because none of us are getting away from it. Like it's happening, right? And then we all go like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. It's not happening. And I was so in that camp. You know, my mother would say, oh, and I, and I go, don't say that. Literally, I was in the same camp of let's not talk about it. If you don't talk about it, it might not happen. Or so your parents happen. wanted to talk, like they would kind of intersperse it and you would shut it off don't say that you know my mom would go well when I go to the big kitchen in the sky and I would be like mom don't say that right um and then my dad got sick and I started to think about like how do I coach people in their life I go okay first you get clear on what the dream is because if you don't know where you're going and you're not really connected to the why it's easy to sell out on something if you're not really connected to the why for diet or health or wellness, you know, it's easy to go, eh, it doesn't really matter. But once you write the dream and it's your dream and it moves you, right? So I started thinking, uh oh, my dad is dying. First of all, do I have a dream? I'm like, ugh, dream? That sounds like what, right? But it actually really was powerful. So then when I sat, usually when I write a dream, I go, okay, what are the bullet points? What are the things I really want in this dream? And then I weave it together to include feelings and emotion and really has me get excited about it because- Let's, let's go back just a smidge because a dream. Why, let's explain dream real quick because it's different than a goal. It's different than an aspiration. It's different than a lot of things like dream, how we- envision something to turn out something in our heart like what is a dream yeah a dream is literally giving language we usually have our clients write a year out right so it's far enough to be a stretch but it's doable right so a dream is really where you see yourself a year from now written in the present tense right because you want to trick yourself into believing it's happening it's so much more powerful powerful to go I am strong and lean and confident versus I will be strong and lean and confident, like a very different, like arms distance versus like standing in it. So we do present tense. We have no digs, which has you go, like, it's not like, you know, I don't feel old anymore or finally wearing clothes that aren't (laughs) trash bags. Right. (laughs) Right. So you're taking away any of the digs, any of the negatives, we take out the always, right? Because that has it not believable either. I always share everything, right? Which has you go, there's sometimes you, you really, it's smarter not to share. You know, like you're actually <laughs> taking care of somebody, getting clear on what you want to say, right? Um, right, and it's, like I said, it's written in the present tense, no digs, no negatives, and it includes feelings, Because you have to really feel it, which is what differentiates it from a goal. A goal is a black and white. So I say there's the dream and then there's the goal. And then there's the actions that you take to get the goal, to realize the dream. Got it. So even with your dad dying, you had a dream for what that looked like, like his, the process, like the whole, I guess, end of relationship, not end of relationship, because I know that's not what it is, but the end of life, right? That was the dream. Right. So I start to go, hmm, okay, so if I'm going to write a dream, like the things that really matter to me or matter to us, but mostly matter to me, because it's my dream for my relationship for saying goodbye to him and doing it beautifully and brilliantly. Right. So I go, I don't really know what even matters. Like, I'm not even sure what really matters. 
Like, Mm -hmm. oh, and actually, I don't even want to talk about this with him because my inner dialogue, what's getting in the way is saying to me, I'm going to make him feel bad. I'm going to make him scared. He's really not going to want to talk about it. Right. But the truth is, I was scared. I was worried. I didn't want to talk about it. And when my coach is like, what do we teach? We teach to go, you know, get clear as to what you want, what's getting in your way, go have the conversation with him. So the first conversation with my dad was, I'm scared to bring this up. You know, at some point, yes, it's going to happen, but I prefer not to think about it. You know, oops. And, and I said, I'm not even sure what to write about a dream. Like, yeah, you're alive and you're dead and everything was well like that. That's not a dream. Right. (laughs) So uh, my dad and I said to him, first thing, I'm really scared to talk about this because I'm worried that I'm going to forget the sound of your voice. And I'm worried that like, you're not going to be with me. I talk to my dad every day. Um, you know, I was like, I'm sad. And I somehow think it's better to avoid the topic than to talk to you. And right away, my dad said, no, we really do have to talk about this. And I've been waiting to talk to you about this. Wow. And he said, and by the way, don't worry about forgetting the sound of my voice. I was like, what? He said, when you see it, what did I tell you when you're a little girl and you saw a penny on the floor, on the ground? I said, oh, you said the angels are talking to us. And he said, yes. When you see a penny on the ground, I will be talking to you. You will never worry about, and you should never worry about forgetting the sound of my voice because, you know, I won't be far. Right. So that was like my first aha about having a conversation that can actually make a difference. That my inner dialogue is not the truth. That right. it's not going to be something that is going to make things worse. That having the conversation and cop to a tipness with him about like, I'm scared to tell you this was the game changer. Cause then he was able to go, no. And I want to talk to you about this because like we had to go teach the world how to do this. Well, and I know like outside of even the area of death, so much of the relationship between children and parents, you know, we think as children, we don't want to bring up the fact that our, you know, our parents got divorced and it hurt us, or you don't want to bring up your experience, our experiences, because we're scared we're going to hurt our, our parents. But I know with the Handel method and in the way that it's taught and the way people work it, it's actually, the parents are waiting to have a gateway, a doorway to, to say what they want to say, to maybe apologize, to maybe own their part, you know, just, and so it's probably the same way with parents and toward the end too, they want to be able to have a door to say what they need to say. Totally. And to own and get clear. Nobody really wants to die with a secret. Nobody wants to die unresolved. That's, I don't believe, I don't believe that, which is like when you said, when you cop to it with everything with your daughter, you felt the relief and an ease. I think when people talk about the taboo subjects, it's a way to really just open up a conversation and then have real dialogue about what matters. Right. You know, so, so once I had that conversation, then I said to my dad, what, what does matter to you? Here's what matters to me. I want to spend time with you. Here's what matters to me. I want to have no secrets, right? Because secrets are the place that people feel misunderstood or misheard or an outsider. I was like, I just want you to know me like soul to soul, not father to daughter or daughter to father, you know, because we usually usually go one way or the other, like we're the one that knows better and these are our parents or this is my parent. I have to look a certain way to, to stay the good daughter, you know, right. and being a twin, oh, being the good one was always <laughs> Oh, that's right. Your twin. Yeah. I didn't even, oh gosh, I can't imagine having to be the good twin. <laughs> oh my God. It's a, you know, it takes something. Right? What pressure? What pressure? So, right. but that really opened an entire opportunity for me to really go deep and talk to my dad about telling him the things I want to tell him, asking him the questions I wanted to ask him 
figure out what he really, really cared about. I'm like, okay, forget about the logistics. I mean, the logistics are there. Like, do you have a will? And you know, like those basics, yes, that all has to be covered too. But I knew that was covered. But for me, it was like, what do you really care about? You know, what do you love doing that matters most to you? Right. And then really listening to him, which then informed how I was writing my dream, because my dream was to, you know, do the things he cared about to, you know, spend time with him, do those things that mattered. And the things he discussed or he talked about was not things I thought about. He was like, I want to keep reading books and studying. My dad, you know, he had a master's degree, but he kept taking classes. He just liked to learn. So, you know, the college that was close by, he would just retake, I don't know, he took a couple classes, the same class over and over just to like keep learning and growing. I know, adorable. Right, but he's like, I want to keep, I want to go to bookstores. I want to keep learning. I want to keep growing. Okay. I like like that and I love conversations and let's talk about the things that matter. Like I want to learn with you, right? And then he said, I, I want, my dad would write letters to all his grandkids, handwritten letters. So the, the tradition was when they went to college, he would write you a letter a week, right? And then as more of the grandkids started going to college, like yikes, right? So then he's <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to write to one grandchild and we're going to rotate, right? But he really enjoyed writing those letters. So he's like, until I can't, I want to continue to write letters. And in those letters, he would tell little stories either about when they were younger or about when he was younger, you know, fun little stories so that they would have those memories and that tradition to take with them. You know, and he talked about, I want to give your mom treats. I want to like do things for your mom. Right. And I'm worried I can't drive anymore. So how am I going to do that? What am I going to bring her? He was never like with big gifts, but just little things. Well, wow. That'd be fun for me. You know, I want to get in on that. So that was the beginning of me like weaving together this dream for end of life with him. Right. And then when I wrote the dream, I included these things. And then actually, after I wrote the dream, I said to my dad, can I read this to you? And he's like, yeah, let's see if I have something to add. (laughs) Let's see if you got everything. Right. So I was like, okay. Right. So I read him and he's like, I have something to add. I was like, you do. Right. And he's like, he's so he had me add this one line. I actually have that dream written here, but yeah, it was like, he, let's read it. Don't you want to read it? I do. But he okay. had me add a one line about like, my dad was a teacher and like, he cared about changing the world. So he's like, yeah, I, I want a line in there about you being on your mission and me like nodding to you going like continuing the lineage. I was like, I love that, right? So let me just read this to you. We sit close, deep in conversation, discussing the simple and the complicated, the unusual and the ordinary, the important and the trivial. We talk about it all. You teach me how to dream as you learn what really matters in life. And I dream bigger about what is possible for our world. Together, we go on adventures, just you and me off to explore and feel the fresh air as time grows short. We go to bookstores and you pick books so you can continue to read and learn. We go to church on sleepy Sunday afternoons so you can have quiet time with candles and icons whispering to God and the angels. We sneak away to the ice cream store so you can surprise mom with a special treat. We laugh with mom and Josie and Rod remembering the fun we had and the memories we created. The kids clamor for more of your stories and handwritten letters. By your side, I quietly promise you that I will be the matriarch and lead our family with heart and wisdom. I declare my life's work in changing lives and you smile and nod, approving of my mission, which is the continuation of yours. You promise to continue to lead the way, guiding me with pennies and horses and the sounds of the ocean. By talking, we teach others to talk. By sharing all our secrets, we teach others to share their secrets, the secrets that lead them lonely and misunderstood. 
By living each moment together, we teach others to laugh and appreciate the world as it is. By loving each other, we teach others to love eye to eye and soul to soul. Now and to the end of time. Wow. So it really was like, for me, it was such a power. I could have written the dream like, I take care of you and it's great. You know, I could have written the dream from that place. But once I add in what really mattered, mm -hmm. it totally shifted the dream to be like, then when I would read this dream, I'd be like, no, I'm on it. When I wanted to just go lay in bed and cry and put the covers over my head and go like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I would look at the dream and go, oh, wait, what matters? Why, why do I want to keep having conversations? You know, come on, let's go to the ice cream store. It got me present to the dream and my why. Wow. And how grateful are you that you went through that process? I mean, can how close was the dream to the reality? Like your reality at the end, was it right there? Was that what you lived into? It your was, dad? it was like, I did, I would take him Sunday. He's like, I can't go. I want to go to church, but I can't go to church in the morning. It's just too much. Like, I'll take you in the afternoon. Like, we'll do, you can go, I'll make sure the church is out. Go light the candles. Like, you know, it, it and it was great because it allowed me to do things that he cared about and got me connected to that. It allowed me to be his advocate for what he really cared about, which was so important for me. And then it allowed me to say everything. You know, there is nothing when I lay my head down, I'm like, I wish I said that. Oh, wow. Or I wish I had done that. And if you know the old me, the old me was like, la, 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 la. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not happening. Maybe we shouldn't talk about it. I'm going to hurt his feelings. I'm going to make him sad. Let me just pretend, which was not changing anything, actually. You know what I mean? It's like moving the furniture in the Titanic. The Titanic is still going down. I'm like, I'm right. like, oh, let me step around rather than actually deal with it. Right. Wow. So writing that dream was a powerful way to get me present. And it also got me in dialogue and sharing. Now, and then if you have a parent that's like, I don't want to talk about it, right? I really don't. Then you could still write your dream, but you just write the dream from, you could still ask them, hey, what do you want to do? You know, you don't have to go, right. what do you want to do before you die, right? But you could go, what matters most to you? What do you care about? Right. And this all goes back to the concept of, of really authoring where we are. And, and so much of, I know just from, from being a part of Handel is we as humans want someone else to do you know, they owe me the conversation. They owe me the apology. I'm not calling them. Like, you know, not all of us have great relationships with our parents. Some of us, you know, have lost our parents, but how do you reconcile a troubled relationship and this idea of a dream? And, and where is the disconnect when it feels like the Titanic's go, or where's the connection when it feels like the Titanic's going down and it, the bridge is just like too far to, to me, like, wh what do you do with, with that? You know, and someone who doesn't have a great relationship with their parents and, and you write the dream anyway, it does, how do you write something that feels real, that feels impossible? Yeah. Well, first I think you have to go back to the relationship and go, okay, like we teach something called laundry lists, meaning like make a list of everything you're holding against somebody not to share with them. Not to share. <laughs> keep it to yourself <laughs> but what you're doing is you're writing down everything and then you're going back to your list and you're looking at it and you're going here's where the cuptuitiveness comes in you're like okay is it every time she never calls me he always makes me wrong is it never is it always right and then once you start to really look at the laundry list and go what was my part in that where do I poke the bear <laughs> like where do I just don't hold the boundaries where do I know the answer I'm getting? And I go for it anyway. Like, Are yeah. you talking about me, Hildy? <laughs> <laughs> I feel attacked. I feel personally attacked right now. <laughs> Poking the bears. Yeah, but, right. 
but who knows? Like, and it doesn't let your parents off the hook. They're human. They're humans. They're just doing the best they possibly can. Some of them might have mental health concerns. Some of them might, you know, who knows? There's a host of reasons why you don't have a great relationship with your parent, right? And it's not to blame. It's for people that don't, it's not to blame you. It's just to go stop and go, okay, what do I want? What is my part in the dynamic? What is good for me to have, right? So if someone has a parent that it's not safe for them to be around, right? Your dream might be very different than somebody else. It, it might be, you know, thanking them for what they gave you. It might be, you know, it might even be writing a dream from afar, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it just depends. So some of this is very personal based on, you know, not all parents are healthy mentally well. Not all parents want to talk about dying, you know, so depending on where they are. But if you have a challenge with your parent, then I'd say make the list on your parent, right? And there's like more specific ways how to do that, but I just don't want to get into that now. And, you know, we could talk about how they can learn how to do that, but make the list and then look at the list and go, what's, what's there for me to own here? And what, what is there that I should do that balances things out and keeps me safe, but has me be proud of the dynamic that I'm in with them. Right. understanding right. that we think our parents should be better than us, but actually we're the iPhone, they're still the flip phone. And some people might even have parents that are the rotary phone, right? Like, <laughs> right? But we somehow think that our parents should be more evolved than us. And the truth is the way it works with lineage, we're called to be more evolved than they are. Right. And, and then when you understand that allows you to go into the dynamic with a little more compassion and understanding for where they are, for where their struggles are, right? Because you grew up around their struggles. So if you really step back, you can see what, what they are. Right. And then just having compassion doesn't mean you're going to change them. It just gives you the perspective of how to design with a little more of compassion for them, but also for yourself. Right. No no beating yourself up either. Right. And I talked to Lauren Zander back in, I don't know, February or March on the podcast. And this was before I got throttled by Handel (laughs) starting in April and I've been on the course, but she, you know, she had said something like, why don't you have a conversation with your parents about their sex life about, and I'm like, you're crazy. Like you're a crazy person. I'm not, you know, I'm, there's no way. And then I started working with you guys and I did like my family history, my research. I had all these conversations with my parents and they were some of the most beautiful conversations, the most hilarious because part of Handel method, um, this is the part that kept me away for three years, but it's when you like confess a lot of your lies And, um, I thought I had my parents on the phone one day, both of them sitting there on Facebook. And I said, well, can I read you my lie list? Cause I had a bunch of lies that involved them. And my mom, she went ghost white and my dad's, my dad's hard of hearing. So he was like, what you want to do what? And I was like, read you my lies. And, and they both were like, we don't think we want to know this, you know? And I started reading them some of my lies. Like, I know I said, I never smoked pot, but I did it twice. (laughs) <laughs> and they, I mean, by the time I got to the end, they were like, is that all, is, is that all you lied to us about? And I said, yeah. And they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. And they, they said, have you been carrying that burden of, of, you know, it was just hilarious, you know, because we as children, not everyone, but I had the relationship that these are my parents. I cannot disappoint them. The news flash is I'm 40. <laughs> it's okay to, you know, not have that dynamic. And in talking to them, I shifted the relationship to what you said, more soul to soul. Like we are humans. We are no longer in this parent-child relationship as the dynamic was growing up. And so the conversations, the opportunity 
it taught me so much and about doing the best that they could, like learning about my grandparents and learning about my great grandparents. They were special. And to think, wow, we really have evolved. <laughs> like we really have done, they did a good job con considering where they came from. And that's the kind of stuff you just don't have a clue about until you start to look at everything more openly. Like how can I dream a better relationship? And right. it's magical. It really is. Yeah. And look, it's not like you're just vomiting on somebody like, yeah, here's everything. You really take care of them through the process. But what we lie about actually rules us. And when mm -hmm. what we hold in, we actually believe is true. And we actually use it to like beat ourselves up and make ourselves not right. And we think we know what the result is going to be when we tell them. But the truth is, we have no idea. And then the freedom that comes with just, you know, people knowing who you are, like there's no more hiding that, you know, there that's magical and that's freeing. Right. So, you know, and like I said, it doesn't mean bleh all over somebody right away, but it's really designing conversations beautifully, being clear on the dreams. So you're like, here's my dream for my relationship with you. Like, I want us to really know each other. I, I want to, you know, know you soul to soul, eye to eye. I want to be, I want to not see you like just a parent. I want to know your struggles. I want to know what you're proud of. I mean, most of us, if we went back and had to answer questions about our parents, like what their struggles were, what they were the most proud of, what was the hardest time in their life, um, what was the most difficult relationship they were in, I don't think most of us can answer any of those questions. But we walk around acting like, oh, they're just our parents, right? But if we really understand the dynamic or what they went through or their humanness, it really opens up a different level of compassion and understanding for your lineage and for what you're here to evolve in that lineage. Right. You know, so, you know, I don't, my kids, they're going to evolve. Like they're going to be more like, I'm like, I oh, don't talk about it. You know, and my kids are like, Hey, let's talk about it. They're already evolving at one step further. Of course I needed a little shove to start talking. <laughs> right. And they're like, la la la, you know, but that's called evolving. Right. And I want to have you back to talk about traits because that is another big part of this whole evolving is figuring out where, uh, the traits in our lineage pop up and where we think we're never like that man. And then you just realize you're so much like them, <laughs> so much like them. That's um, the joke. <laughs> that's the ha ha. That is the funny when you start to dig into that, but it's so beneficial. And so Hildy, what is something that, you, you know, you talked about your purpose and, and, you know, you you and your dad, you're continuing your joint purpose and, and the work that he did. And so what, what is your purpose? What do you want people to understand about writing dreams and end of life? And, and how do you want to continue this work? I want people to start talking because talking matters and talking allows you to really understand somebody. Like my mission is to teach people how to say goodbye to loved ones, you know, from e either loved ones that are going or really begin to design your relationships for yourself when you go and to live your life like it matters because mm. none of us are off the hook for dying, right? But then that then leads to question, if death is over, always over your shoulder tapping, then that leads to question, what do I want to do to really live? You know, what is on my bucket list? What do I care about the most? Which then had me go to my dad and go, what do you care about the most? Which then had me go, hey, what do I care about the most? What are the, some of the things that I really care about the most that I want to create or that I want to do or that I care about, right? Which then has me now live my life very purposefully. So death is not just, let me say a beautiful goodbye to somebody, but it also is, how do I now take this time that I have, these 24 hours, the same 24 <laughs> hours that everybody has, how do I now use this 
to like, like it really matters. Right. Well, Hildy, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I'm excited to be here. You know, if I could get everybody just talking a little bit and beginning to ask questions and, you know, get curious, there is a difference. That's right. That's right. Thank you.